In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. Zach, would you characterize the risk of a person putting their money in, in BlockFi to being akin or being almost the same level of risk of a person just having their money on an exchange because it's a key management risk? Or is there more risk that, that doesn't meet the eye with BlockFi? I think it depends on the exchange. I think it's certainly in the same ballpark. And there are probably quite a few exchanges where I would categorize it as more risky to hold your assets there versus BlockFi. And there are exchanges where I would categorize it as less risky because they're not offering the same service that we are, where there is, even though it's very small, but there is an incremental layer of risk because of the lending that we're doing to generate the yield. So I would say it's both, but from a user experience perspective, the same kind of value that Mark was alluding to around just making it super easy or enabling me to send money to to and from this account and my bank or get paid for referring a friend to it, like know who I am. And if I lose my password, help me recover it safely. Like there's a lot of things that a centralized financial services company can do that add a lot of value for people like me. I tried the the hardware wallet thing and I didn't sleep well at night. Not because I don't love the idea of it, not because I don't believe that it's one of the unique and incredible characteristics of Bitcoin that gives it value, but just because I lose my car keys once a quarter. It, it's not my style or, or personality to want to keep track of a of a large amount of of money. You had mentioned early on when we were talking about that there's a there's a portion of the the funds that you manage that are under collateralized. I'm curious what that would be kind of as a percentage of the overall funds and then why are some of them under collateralized? As a percentage of the overall funds, I don't know the exact number today. It's well south of 50%, maybe even south of, of 20%. Why is that? Well, certain institutions who borrow from BlockFi are getting, go back to that example with Siskahana. I started trading with 10 million. It worked out great. Now I want to do it with a hundred. Their return improves if part of that hundred million that they're making markets with is debt, not equity. Their equity has a pretty high hurdle rate in terms of the return that they want to generate on it. And so for the same reason, folks finance all types of investments, whether it's real estate or, or other investments, market making firms like to finance their activities. And BlockFi in our institutional services team, which primarily comes from prime brokerage backgrounds, are familiar with and, and comfortable underwriting the credit risk of these firms. And as a result, it's more valuable for them if we can get comfortable taking some amount of credit risk and not always requiring over collateralization. And we're capable of assessing that risk. Not for everyone. Not a lot of people pass the credit risk assessment threshold. Less than 50 firms ever have passed it. That's how it works. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 